most prestigious lawyers of Cuba have studied in this faculty. Among them, Fidel Castro, former president and historical leader of the revolution. He confessed that in this university, he became a revolutionary man. This country updates its economy, but new legislation is necessary to help and organize what's happening in the private sector. To know the insights of this, we talked to Professor Leonardo Perez Gallardo, a public notary and a strict guardian of the future of this specialty in Cuba. Let's uh, step down this staircase. I like going up and down this staircase, the one to your left when you get in as it is the one for those who pass. So from my student days, I knew that entering over it would mean good grades. Almost nobody goes up and down that staircase. It is always empty. The one that uses this one, this school, has had historic leaders and students, and it is part of Cuban history, and uh, many generations of uh, law students have graduated from it. They have uh, written the laws of this country, which may have been good or bad or imperfect or criticized, but they wrote them. Let's continue the interview in the amphitheater. In the press international, there is a vision very stereotyped of Cuba. In the foreign press, there's a stereotyped vision of Cuba, and they sometimes suggest that this country is like a chaos in terms of law and that we're not a state respectful of the citizens' rights. We have a constitution passed in referendum in 1976. What are the possibilities, the potentials of that document that makes Cuba a state of law? Yes, Cuba, in any context or environment, it's always being watched very closely. If you can see it even in exact sciences, what can you expect in the fields of social sciences and legal sciences in the very practice of the law? The Cuban Constitution was passed in 1976 and it was amended twice in 1992 and 2002. It should be said first that Cuba is a country with a constitutionalist tradition. There are the constitutions of the independence wars, the 1901 constitution, and the very important 1940 constitution. Sometimes there are judgments about the country or state, and the question is of the rule of the law really have not only a political but a derogative approach to Cuba, though possibly that is happening less frequently as before. In Cuba, there is not only the Constitution and the Supreme Law, but there are also ordinary laws, and the Constitution enshrines essential rights, and some lawyers may call them uh, fundamental rights or human rights enshrined in the Constitution plus formal and material guarantees. An issue that may be particularly polemical but does justify a questioning of the rule of the law is possibly the absence in Cuba of a constitutional guarantees court or a constitutional court. Historically, Cuba was among Latin American countries with a constitutional and social guarantees court. Such court would ensure not just the enforcement of laws but the correct reading and enforcement of ordinary and lower laws under the Constitution. The absence of a constitutional guarantees court also implies there are no recourses of inconstitutionality against ordinary laws and recourses under the Constitution where there are violations of uh, fundamental rights. But this absence of control by constitutional guarantees court is replaced by diffuse and abstract form of control. Do you think it's necessary to have one? Yes, I think so. Regardless of the fact that the constitutionality of the laws is greatly supervised also by the Attorney General of the Republic, I think yes. Perhaps not a constitutional court, but at least a court of constitutional guarantees within the Supreme Court that measures the constitutionality of rules of law. 
In Cuba, as everyone in the world, there is a proliferation, an explosion of rules of law, a globalization of rules of law of all sorts, decrees, decree laws, and many ministerial resolutions which beget contradictions among themselves that are a real headache for law practitioners because they find a resolution that came after a decree law, but it amends a decree law, and that can be due to the hierarchy of the laws. This could be solved by a constitutional guarantees court. At least, I would be happy with a constitutional guarantees court. However, sometimes we get the impression, Professor, that our constitution is not that known, not only by the population, but by the people that apply the law. What are the consequences of this ignorance? Listen. And by the way, I am not a constitutional law professor, but those who are constitutional law professors in Cuba are always worried about the direct enforcement of the constitution. That is, that a legal document of a claimant is based on a constitutional precept which justifies the claim. And courts, while handing down sentences, should do so following the Constitution. I'm saying this first so that you realize the great concern there has been over the enforcement of the Constitution as the highest law in the legal system and as a law under which all legal actions take place in the country. An interesting and important thing follows from it, namely the extent to which the population are familiar with the Constitution. I don't know, but it would be interesting to have a poll to measure knowledge among youth, high school youth, grammar children, or the population at large, because not knowing the Constitution means not knowing the basic guarantees every citizen has because it is, he is a Cuban citizen. It includes everything about migration, citizenship, fundamental rights, employment the policies, the right to work, the right to health. Everything is enshrined in the Constitution. What happens? There is a question I always ask myself and find no answer. Why do people are not familiar with the Constitution? Even when a minister issues a rule of law or ministerial resolution, he should pay its expository part on the Constitution. When a judge hands down a sentence, he should do it in line with the Constitution. I study sentences, and unfortunately, the Constitution is not always taken into account. It is so in the field of family law conflicts, but not always in other legal conflicts as in the field of contractual law or civil law where there is no substantive application of the Constitution in the uh, wording of a sentence. Sometimes we say citizens should know the Constitution, but it is us jurists and law professionals who should have full and total knowledge about the Constitution and see it as ours and teach classes from a constitutional perspective. Maybe in that sense would be interesting to talk about something that is worrying some people. Besides the fact that the Constitution should be taught better, people don't see in the current legislation answers to the problems we are living. Is the legislation in Cuba changing at the same rhythm of the rest of the changes? And especially in this moment in which so many new kinds of business are emerging and concepts being updated like property and employment. But this is not happening. And I would like your opinion. What is the result of leaving legislation that behind? No, no, unfortunately, in my judgment, they are not. There is a general principle which states that the law will always come after social and economic needs. That is, you cannot pass a rule of law prior to the existence of a social or economic phenomenon. But that's not what is happening in Cuba. I fully agree that there is already a social and economic need to have certain rules whose absence provokes a lack of protection for certain sectors in social and economic activities.
but there is also a closely linked matter. Some existing rules have turned obsolete and others were precociously obsolete when they were issued. What do I mean by precociously obsolete? Those rules which were passed at a given time and at a very short time, they aren't attuned to social realities. And we jurists are experiencing that, and particularly those of us who have our practice vis-a-vis -vis the public every day. There are so many questions they ask us, and we can't give an answer based on the law. Today, there are social strata with an urgent need for a rule of law which protects them and which brings consistency. That's another problem facing us. One rule is not consistent with another or with a general principle or with a higher rule. That also brings legal chaos. Un desfase, profesor, entre el... It's clear that there is a disconnection between the reality and the legislative activity. There is a debate in Cuba about the need of changing the family code because of the pledge of people that want to have the marriage between same-sex individuals recognized in this document. We talked about this with Dr. Mariela Castro, the head of the Center for Sexual Education and a congresswoman. And I would like your opinion. What is it that has to happen to see this change, or at least debate it and see something happening in this direction? Why the family code and other kinds of legislation don't change at the same rhythm that the people, the population needs? The family code is a rule of law with a long record of amendments already. We have been working on family code amendments for about 20 years now. It is among the most socially enrooted laws or codes. It is not the same amending laws on car sales contracts than on the concept of marriage or divorce. I do believe there should be already an updating of the family code. That's something similar to what took place in 1975 when the family code was approved takes place now. If there is a rule of law requiring a debate among the population, as was the case with the labor law, it is the family code. To kind of get in the views, the communist opinion of both law professionals who can make contributions to people from other sectors. And it is a rule involving not only the criteria of jurists, but of civil society sectors, and essentially of other scientific circles, particularly those of social sciences. Today, Common law marriage between persons of the same gender is an item for debate in most parliaments and positions are very different. There are countries like Uruguay and Argentina which have codified and included it in the civil code and there are others like Chile, yes, Chile, where it's been codified recently but as a civil union and not as marriage. In this sense, a political definition must come first to then decide whether it will be codified as marriage or a factual union. But, very important, it would be necessary to have a constitutional reform first. Because the 1976 Constitution copied and transcribed the concept of marriage from the family code, and thus it has given the notion of marriage a constitutional character. Marriage is defined as a union of a man and a woman, so there is no other reading which legally accepts the marriage between persons of the same gender. That's what the Constitution states now. But in a constitutional reform, it would be necessary to determine whether either marriage or factual union should be codified. But there is no doubt that part of the population also needs uh, legal protection both as to family and property. We notaries and lawyers have been seeing that. To see this change happening, Professor, what has to happen? And I know you're very updated about all this, this debate. Where is it? Is the document there? What's going on with the parliament in this sense? What's happened with the family code? In my judgment, from 2011 to 2015, priority has been given in the country to all the laws about the economy. And this, according to my perception as a university professor, 
has led Parliament to focus essentially during this period on the passing of economic draft legislations in line with the economic guidelines which were approved in 2011. Let's see if it can be prioritized in 2016-2021, and I think it is the rule of law mostly in need of amendments. But let me tell you something. It is true that one of the things mostly frequently covered by the media is that of uh, couples and marriages made up by persons of the same gender. But in my judgment, the new family code should regulate principles on minors, on disadvantaged people among the population like disabled persons, on the economic regime of marriage, it must be decided whether there will be only common assets. Why a single economic regime of marriage? Why can't spouses have separate properties? As you put it so rightly, in actual fact, you cannot have separate properties in marriage, but persons buy things for third parties, and so they have a double standards. That is, we keep the family code, whose economic regime states common or partial ownership of assets acquired during marriage, but to a great extent, such common ownership is non-existent because people buy for third parties. That must go. What saddens me as a jurist is that people continue pretending and using fronts. When you see there are fronts involved or there is a pretense in an action, it is so because the rules of law are setting up hurdles and obstacles which make no sense. Some are still in place. And that's what leads to nonsensical situations. See what's happening with car sales. Nobody marries in order to sell a car anymore. House swaps are almost gone completely. Cuban cinema produced a comedy about house swaps and later one about house sales because house sales have replaced the swaps. That's the logical thing. In almost no society, you see swaps. Swaps were done by cavemen. Today, everybody wants to sell his house and buy another one. And I say such logic applies to family law because it is the focus of attention. I agree one of the issues to be debated first by the public and then in Parliament to carry it or not is marriage between persons of the same gender or their union. But there are many issues like curatorship, legal custody of children, custody, adoption, potestas, adoption international adoption, whether it's admitted or not, and how a more flexible custody, the possibility that persons appoint their own custodians or curators, self-custody, self-curatorship, and administration of assets of minors, not by their biological parents, but by a third party. This last case is becoming frequent and real to us. For instance, a mother who, in case of death, wants her inheritance to be handled by her sister, not by the child's father. But the present rigidity of the family code on this makes it impossible. For instance, there is the interesting situation of a minor whose father is abroad and can or wouldn't return to the country. And no ruling on the minor's properties can be handed because nobody can represent him. So that would take adding a rule of law to the family code stating that under exceptional circumstances, the custody would go only to the other parent who is living in Cuba and the minor's interest would not be harmed as a minor cannot buy or sell. So you can see how many interesting situations you may find I understand the importance and weight of property in the economy, but nothing is more important as family. We all are family. We all have a family. We all die in the family. So today, law professionals are really calling for a new family code that revolutionizes a country which, in the sense of public policies, has been a pioneer in protecting children and disabled persons. Usted hablaba de la necesidad de, de que para que también todo esto suceda se ponga en You talked about the need of making all this a priority. And there is an issue, professor. Sometimes people don't see their own legislation as a protection against certain violations of their rights. For example, if someone sees some something wrong, like some some of their rights being violated in any way, they tend to use a different solution. They uh, use a political solution. They write a letter to a minister, 
or to a political leader. They trust more in those people, in those authorities, that in the law, that in the legislation that exists, among other things, to protect them. How to create a consciousness that change this? and how to strengthen uh, our own institutions to change this. How to fix this, Professor, your opinion on this sense? Yes. We began this conversation talking about the rule of the law, and I told you I'd really like to have a constitutional guarantees court. That's the answer. Usted, Professor de Derecho de Sucesiones. You teach succession law, all that has to do with inheritance, and that gives you a sharp perception of what's going on in Cuba in terms of changes. Changes that, by the way, people tend to relate too much with December 17th announcement, when all this was going on far before. We had a migration reform in Cuba, but the legislation related to properties and inheritance stays the same. What are the challenges in this sense, Professor? Today, one of the big challenges is to make coincidental points in private international law more flexible, because a greater migration means the possibility of having a greater number of foreign laws that might be applicable in the country. As there are more Cubans marrying uh, foreigners, something which can be seen easily in statistics showing this phenomenon of growing numbers of Cubans uh, with a double citizenship in other nations and who can return now to this country or have a temporary residence abroad without severing links with Cuba thanks to the amendments to the migration law, the result is Cubans with properties in both Cuba and abroad. And Cuban rules still say that the applicable law continues to favor citizenship and the criterion should be domicile instead of citizenship. Also, the civil code states that he who has left the country for good cannot inherit anything. This concept as defined in Civil Code Article 4.70 should be revised because the numbers of such people will be dwindling as all those who leave Cuba to reside temporarily in another country will keep links with Cuba. But because of that concept, many have been declared as not entitled to inherit. And not only those who left Christina, but their children, the minors who were incapable to make such a decision as was made by their parents. Still, they are deprived of their inheritance rights. And it goes also for those who were born abroad. So I think we should think of ways of changing inheritance laws and rereading inheritance rules and not just those in the civil code, but those pertaining to private international law. This is an issue rarely raised in, bar, in the bar, but it will be increasingly important in every act of life by Cubans. You've been talking about so many tasks, so many things to do, Professor, big challenges for the institution and the institutionality in general, for the legislators, lawyers, and the political class. Are those tasks staying in this classroom, in your talks with your users or clients? I think that together, political experts and academics can write rules which are well thought and within the reach of all, rules which make sense and are logical and rational, but also that these rules of law provide new keys. It is not a matter, Cristina, of reanimating a patient in a serious condition, but of saving his life. I think this is the core of the matter, because there are rules of law which are rational. A rule should be put to a test to measure its rationality, proportionality, its equality, and also a test to see its logic. Otherwise, it will be an atrophied rule, and consequently, the subjective rights of a person will suffer. People say it's very hard to pass the notary test in Cuba and that you have something to do with that. Well, so many things can be said and many things are said about notarial law and how it is taught. I believe that among the various forms 
of the legal profession, one of the most demanding as to theoretical knowledge is notarianship and being a notary. In every time and period, the Ministry of Justice has applied tests to applicants wanting to be notaries. I am proud of being a notary and to be so in a country which, even during the hardest of times, has kept a serious test to be done by notarianship applicants. Being a notary, Christina, is being a social chronicle. Recently, I was telling my students in class about something I had uh, read and which impressed me because of the message it conveys. It is said that a notary sentences for life in a prison of papers the fleeing moments of life. It is not just poetry because we can preserve in time all social events with a legal connotation. We are also sort of legal uh, priests because we get to know so many professional secrets like marriages, divorces, last wills, inheritances and transfer of titles. And those notaries documents are your life's uh, works because they include everything a notary will treasure as instruments in dictum. And in this very theater, I've taught over 25 classes of students the love for notarianship. But love for notarianship presupposes dedication to the profession, an honest practice, because no doubt you value more as a great treasure what was hard for you uh, to get. The answer is yes. It's difficult and you are responsible for that. El presidente Raúl Castro, al comienzo President Raúl Castro, professor, has called for the strengthening of the institutionality so that the institutions play their role. He has repeated this several times and even has said how to do it in some ways. But publicly, Professor, we don't see that happening as fast as it should. Why do you think the President called for this and why do you think it's not happening as, as the reason that it should be happening? What's your opinion about this? Yes, I would say institutionality is the concept that defines his term with his austerity and his sense of management and regulation. It is also abiding by the law. When he refers to the topic for the first time, I felt proud because being a jurist, I know that institutionality exists largely thanks to jurists. And the goal is clear and straightforward. Unfortunately, as it is often said, the letter of the law is one thing and what lawyers think is another. Because a reading leads many times to the erection of barriers. In Cuba, there is a certain tendency to erect obstacles and barriers to obstruct the way toward stated goals and projects. And that often prevents having that sense of institutionality. I frequently wonder how come somebody who has to read the law and enforce it doesn't do so to realize the subjective rights of persons or to favor the custody or guarantee of certain rights of individuals and that does so much harm. Why? Because then people, society and the nation see the law as not playing its role and stated function and so jurists have no reason to be because they are not doing their job as defined by the state in terms of their profession. I am trying to give you an answer that is an effort to reconcile realities with the project of the law that I am calling for. Thank you so much, Professor. It's been a privilege.